Welcome to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. I'm your host, Ash Whitener, and this is episode 39, From Homeless to Owning $1 Million Homes, with my guest, Kimi Egan, author of the number one international bestseller, The Power of Real Estate Investing. Kimmy shares her story of losing her physical therapist practice during the recession of 2007 and 8 and literally becoming homeless. I was overnight just flat on my back with nowhere to go. It was probably the scariest week of my life. We join Kimmy as she details her journey and how she started generating cash flow in the UK real estate market even without owning assets. You don't want to miss the part where Kimmy chats about a hot new trend in rental properties and how the decentralized sharing economy is offering opportunities never before available. Would you like to receive all of Liberty Entrepreneur's podcast delivered directly to your email inbox? If so, head on over to our website, libertyentrepreneurs.com and subscribe. Don't worry, we won't send you any spam, only the latest podcast each week. I'd also like to thank all of our new subscribers and to everyone who shares our interviews on social media. We're set to have our best month ever, so thank you. Last but not least, please follow us on Twitter at Liberty E Podcast and Facebook slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. Full show notes are found on our website, libertyentrepreneurs.com. Enjoy the show. We've got Kimmy Egan, freedomacademies.com. Thank you, Kimmy, for coming on the show. Oh, Ash, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me on. So, Kimmy, give us a quick bio and tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I'm Kimmy. I'm the founder of Freedom Academies, Freedom Investment, and the author of the international bestseller, The Power of Real Estate Investing, Seven Steps to Create Wealth and Make Money. And um, I I started, so I'm a real estate investor by trade, and I train and I help others do the same. And I started investing actually when I was homeless, which is a, a bit of a funny way around it. But I had a traditional business. I was a physical therapist and it was all going well. I mean, I, I thought I had it made. I had hundreds of happy clients, you know, nice six figure income. And then the recession happened. And I'm sure you're familiar with the, you know, the small crash that went on in 08. And what happened was that half of my clients or probably 80 to 90 percent of my clients came from insurance company referrals so Mm. if you had a car accident or if you had an accident at work you were referred to me to make you better which was great except they paid 90 to 180 days in arrears sometimes so what that means is if i work today i don't get paid for three to six months yeah it makes it difficult to cash flow business that way doesn't it so so difficult and it's (laughs) it's so wrong uh but it wasn't you know it wasn't tragic once you get over the first six months then you're kind of on top anyway it, it wasn't too bad but when 08 happened these companies went out of business so they not only took with them you know 90 percent of my caseload of my clients but the hundreds and thousands of, of dollars that i'd earned that they owed me during that period went as well yeah and and now you're looking around and you're like not only am i not getting paid for the clients that i've already serviced but i'm not getting any more clients because the insurance companies pretty much rule this type of business yeah, exactly. I was overnight just flat on my back with nowhere to go. It was probably the scariest week of my life. So what happened, Kimmy? Like what, how did you pull yourself back up? How did you get motivated? And what did you start doing after that? I mean, you're homeless now. You have bills coming in and you know, cash flow out, but no cash flow in. What was going through your mind? Sheer panic, to be honest. Um, I started drinking wine. That seemed like a good answer. And panicking. And, I, you know, the first month that this was happening, you kind of did what you what I felt natural to me. So I tried to sell everything I could. You know, I sold my car, I sold books, CDs, carpets, sofas, everything I could on eBay and, and wherever else. And I tried to just get as much money in as I could. But as most people know that have started up brick and mortar type businesses, that takes a lot of cash to start with. So I had director's loans and guarantees and debts and just credit cards coming out of my rear end it was insane and it wasn't even close so every kind of week that went by my debts were racking up because I had to use a credit card to live or I had to take some money off to pay bill or something like that so really quickly I mean I just I just didn't have the money and and I didn't have that much kind of credit either so I ended up moving into my office 
the only I couldn't afford for the business to go under because ironically to go bankrupt you have to pay a fee and I didn't have the and money you didn't to have the money it. to pay that fee right <laughs> no so I couldn't even declare bankruptcy which is the stupidest thing I think I've ever heard mm-hmm. so I moved into the back room of my office in this stupid 60 square foot room with no windows and I had kind of left had like a bag of clothes left in a blow-up bed and I was trying to cook on this camp stove I mean, when you think about it, in hindsight, a camp stove next to a, a blow-up bed is probably the most dangerous thing there is. Yeah, <laughs> not, my... the, not the best. No, no windows or way out. But, you know, you, you do what you have to do. And how free did you feel at that time? Oh, I couldn't have felt any less free. I, I thought I was suffocating, to be honest. Mm-hmm. I just remember there was, you know, the night before things started to change. It was probably a couple of months down the line, maybe three, three or so months. And... um just kind of sat on on the bed crying my eyes out probably still drinking wine and eating chocolate and just I I had no idea where to go and there's something about that feeling of desperation yep desperation and frustration and unfairness and all of these types of emotions that never serve you but but we all have yeah it's easy to get trapped into those emotions tell me how you come to terms with those emotions and then started moving your energy more into the entrepreneurial aspect and all the creativity required yeah that's a great question and i think one of the great things or the things i'm incredibly fortunate for is that i'm a pretty stubborn person right so if you tell me i can't do something i'm, I'm gonna give it a go whether or not i even want to it seems to be outside of my control <laughs> So I felt at that time like I had nowhere to go and my brain just said, you know what? No, 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 this isn't, this isn't the end. So that night I Googled something like how to make money or how should I make money? And I'm incredibly grateful that stuff about real estate came up and not other stuff because who knows where I've been now. But I, you know, I started reading that night and it, you know, a few stats came out to me that 90% of the world's wealthy either made their wealth or held it in real estate. And I thought, mm-hmm. well, you know, that's quite interesting, but... I don't have the money to buy, so, you know, never mind. But then I started reading some books around kind of wealth development and personal development and all of this stuff that I didn't even know existed before. And they started saying things like joint ventures and partnerships and all of that. And then one day I went to a seminar and it was one of the free things. And the trainer said, you have to take ultimate responsibility for everything that happens in your life. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, well, that's easy for you to say. If everything's going well, of course you do. Like, what sure, happened to okay. me wasn't my fault. Right. <laughs> but when you take the emotion out of it, during the good times, I should have put savings away. I should have maybe expanded the business. I should have got other income streams. And I didn't. So actually, you know, in a lot of ways, that was my fault. And when I started to make these mental shifts and realize what I'd done to contribute to it or not, as the case may be, and the things I could do, a whole world opens up. And, you know, I shall be honest, it is scary as hell when you realize that genuinely the world is your oyster, but it's amazingly freeing to know that you've got all of this in front of you. Absolutely. It is free. And with all the information that people are just willing to give away, like you said, a free seminar or even on your website, you know, you have a lot of great videos and you, you've also written a book. Tell me a little bit more about your uh, number one international bestselling book, The Power of Real Estate Investing. Yeah, that's, um, that's my baby. So we, we launched last year. And the reason I wrote it was because I found that when I was trying to to learn this stuff, a lot of it was about kind of no money down strategies that worked pre-2008. And you know what? That changed the game. It changed the whole market. And that the people that were were writing weren't on the front line anymore. So, you know, my, my primary business, my job is investing in real estate. So I know what works. I know what doesn't. I know what marketing we use. I know how we manage our team. And I found myself answering the same questions over and over again to people that either had tried something and it hadn't worked or hadn't quite got the courage to try it yet. So I wrote the book that I would have killed for uh, at the beginning of my career. That is literally like seven steps, bish, bash, bosh. This is how I roll. Yeah. So give give us one or two of those steps. Like give us some uh, give us a little preview of what's in your book and how some of our listeners i know many of them are looking for ways to become more free and i think real estate is a great way to cash flow that i know that a lot of people are very hesitant to get in real estate because of you know the assumed large down payment because you have to work with a bank and get a loan and there's all sorts of legalities and paperwork and stuff in in investing but what do you recommend what does your book recommend for people that are interested in this and want to start getting into cash flow in real estate 
Yeah, and you know, it's entirely true, right? You do have to put down payments down to buy real estate. That's that's the truth. But it doesn't have to be yours. It doesn't have to be your money. And I think that's the bit that's so crucial. And that's the bit that changed my life. You know, I met the person that I bought the first, uh, I think it was four or eight properties with at a networking meeting. He paid for them. I put the work in and then we split the profit. It wasn't my money that did it. I couldn't suddenly magic this up, but we did it together. And I think the... My fate, or the bits that are most popular about my book, for sure, is chapter four, where I share some wealth strategies. And I think there's something like three no money or low money down investing strategies that I use. And it goes through them step by step, how to find the vendors, how to explain it to them, how to make it work and how to make it cash flow. And are these types of strategies still viable post crash? I mean, have things tightened up now? Are banks more reluctant? for these types of strategies or or where does that currently stand? Yeah, so, you know, there there have been some nuances since the crash. So now we're seeing things like having, getting no money down mortgages on low-ball offers, sorry. So getting mortgages on low-ball offers accepted can be difficult because what we're seeing is banks coming back and saying, actually, there is a chance that that person is vulnerable and therefore we don't want to be the one lending on that, you know, if you get sued at some point. Mm -hmm. So banks actually have some type of standards these days. Well, you know, (laughs) once in a while. (laughs) Uh, However, that is an offer and that is a property you could buy with a joint venture partner. Mm. So the strategies I I use in there, I mean, they've all been used or I've used them since 2010. Um, So I I didn't do any. I mean, I had one I lived in before that, but I didn't do any investing before nine oh nine or something like that so i have no idea how easy it was before that it looks amazing so yeah all of the strategies i talk about are the ones we've used since and the ones i use every single day and some of them are actually you don't even buy the property you just control it and they're really amazing right and so what would be one strategy that's helped you grow your real estate business and if you don't mind like help us understand a bit more about your real estate business are you mainly looking for cash flow I know that going to your website uh, freedomacademies.com you give people ideas on how you can do these types of joint ventures but what types of strategies that you before you started teaching or writing books what type of strategy did you use to grow your business yeah so I I mean, we send out now, we've got huge marketing campaigns going on. We've got pay-per-click on like Google. We've got Facebook adverts. We've got leaflets, letters, bandit boards, the whole works going on. And what I've done is make sure that I've trained my team across four or five strategies so that when the leads come in, they can solve the problem for the vendor in a way that, that also allows us to make a profit and make cash flow flip it on. So we are creating win-win situations. And, and, you know, you can't do that with a cookie cutter type thing. You can't just say, I'm going to offer 30% below and and that's it. Take it or leave it. Because for me, that's a little bit unethical and you're not helping anyone solve their problems. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that we're doing at the moment that is hugely successful, and it's a little bit like using the Airbnb model. So we're going to homeowners and property owners that have got a, a house or an apartment of any kind and saying, listen, I'm going to pay your rent for you each and every month. I'm going to guarantee your rent. I'm going to take care of the first $100 of maintenance. You're going to have no fees. You're going to have no um, no maintenance to deal with, no management, no tenants calling you. I'm going to take care of all of it. So let's say their property's on for $1,000 a month. I'm going to pay you 900 and I'm going to take away all your problems. Mm-hmm. The owner is biting your hand off for this. Mm. And now to make money as the investor, you've got two options. The first is to put sharers in. So previously, you would only share a house if you're a student, right? You would kind of get three right. or four of you in a house. But now, because of the raise, the increase in rental prices, we're seeing young professionals sharing for longer because they want to be saving for a deposit to buy their own place. That's right. So if you've got a three or a four bedroom apartment or three or four bedroom house, stick a young professional in each room for maybe six hundred dollars a month, you're at what you're at twenty four hundred dollars for that property. So you're paying the homeowner nine hundred. You're going to pay maybe three hundred in bills and you know a little bit of maintenance, and you're retaining the rest. Right. That's incredible profit from a property you don't own, had no money down, no mortgage, no credit checks, nothing. 
Yeah, because the property is already owned outright. You're just creating a management company. It's like you have the entrepreneurial ability to process out everything that you need. Okay, I need uh, a maid to come through every once in a while, or I need, you know, who can I contact as a handyman if something breaks? Or, you know, maybe I have the advertising channels that just the homeowner simply cannot have. And maybe their home is sitting there and they want to sell it, but they, they're not getting what they want. But you and your team can step in and start cash flowing this thing for them with very little uh, management obligations on their part where you exactly. are the, you're, you're the management and the real estate team. Exactly. And that's you've got it. You nailed it on the head there. You know, you come in as the entrepreneur, look at this asset and go, how can I make more? How can I make this do better? And that is what you said. It's, well, you know, who can I be getting for the handyman? Who can I get in for the cleaner? Because what we're not doing here is helping people create more jobs, right? No one gets into real estate because they're quite fancy cleaning. So you get other people to do this and you make the profit. Yeah, and what's really nice is you actually are creating more jobs because now the homeowner, maybe they don't have someone cleaning their house, but now your tenants need to have their house cleaned and maybe that's another service that they pay you for. Maybe it's included in their rent and now you're hiring uh, a team to come out and clean the house or you're hiring someone to mow the grass. And since you're able to cash flow this, you're able to cover all these costs and still retain the profit because you as the entrepreneur had the vision of seeing there's more value in this house than what it's currently producing. I think with my knowledge, with my experiences, with my team and with my workflows and standard operating procedures, I can I can make this more valuable. Ultimately, that's what the entrepreneur does is sees opportunities in the marketplace where goods are potentially undervalued and help realize the, the true value of those goods. Exactly. I think that's actually the definition of entrepreneur, isn't it? Taking something of low value and, and making it of high value. Yeah, absolutely. That is, like- as entrepreneurs, that's our job. Yeah, that is our job. Our job is identifying value where other people may not be able to. And maybe that's due to your experience or maybe you grew up in like a farm town and you know the value of a tractor, for instance, whenever it's sitting idle versus working and taking all these little pieces, parts as you see them and having like a a puzzle mindset where you can take these parts, put them together and build something that's worth more than the sum of its parts. Exactly. And, you know, that's that's what we do in every part of our business. And that's what we help others to do is to look at things a little bit differently. And, you know, the first things that people say often is, oh, I didn't know you could do that. Oh, you know, I've never heard of that before. And that's kind of the point, isn't it? It's, it's as Warren Buffett says, observe the masses and do the opposite. Figure out what everyone else is doing. And then actually, how can you do it better? How can you add more value? How can you solve more problems? Yeah, the contrarian investors Typically, it takes longer for their investments to work, but usually they, they work in the direction that they are expected. Let's, let's switch gears here a little bit, Kimmy. As an entrepreneur, if you had to do one thing different, if you could do one thing over, what would it be? That's a great question. And You know, when I look back, there is a hundred different answers I could give you. It's one of the frustrating things, isn't it? The benefit of hindsight, as you get more experience, you suddenly realize you could have done everything quicker and better. But I think one of the things I would change is that... At the beginning, I didn't realize that I brought value or I had value. You know, I was at rock bottom. I didn't have any cash. I was living in this office. So when I went out to meet potential people that could have been potential joint venture partners, I didn't know that I was the asset or I had any value to bring to the party. So I'd be like, well, why do they want to invest with me? Why are they giving me their money? I'm not worth anything. But that's absolutely not true. What I had was the knowledge. What I had was um, the I had mentorship and I'd learned some things. I'd spent hours trawling the streets, driving for dollars, looking for for value and trying to get my head around how this worked. I had relationships with agents and contractors by then. So if I could change one thing, it would be to realize earlier the value I brought to the deal. Because actually, when you're standing in front of someone who is confident in what they're saying and their beliefs, you're, you're more willing to buy into them anyway. If they don't buy into themselves, you're never going to. And when I changed gears and when I had that mindset shift, it, it opened some huge doors for me and I suddenly found that, you know, money was coming at me so much faster. How should you ever expect someone to see the value in yourself in you if you can't see the value in yourself? Well, exactly. It's crazy, isn't it? 
Yeah, it really is. So I want to talk a little bit more about the value of Freedom Academies. And this is your website where you promote the ways that you have found work well for real estate investing. And this is your way of trying to help spread knowledge and information to other people that may want to do something similar. Can you tell us how you started Freedom Academies and how you had the idea or the motivation to create this? Yeah, for sure. So as you might have noticed, everything about about me is about freedom. So my investing company, my turnkey investing company is Freedom Investment. Um, so when I was had this idea, freedom had to be in there somewhere. So it became Freedom Academy. So I'm training people to get freedom, freedom of location and financial freedom. And it came about, it wasn't something I ever intended to do. But as you probably know, you know, real estate training and Wealth creation can have a bit of a shady reputation. There's a lot of people that aren't doing us any favours and they're sharing information that, as we said, is at best kind of old and at worst is a bit dodgy, right? It's not something that I would ever sure. advocate and I'm not even sure is legal anymore. So I got really sick of seeing people paying good money for stuff that didn't work. Um, and yeah, that was that's how it came about, really. I thought, you know what, you're right. How can I expect it to change if the good guys aren't coming out saying hey this is how we do it so i'm a huge advocate now of people that have learned stuff to to get out there and share it um i'm very fortunate i mean i'm recording this from portugal i can work from anywhere in the world i have a, a great management team that continue investing for me and i pop back every few weeks and make sure that you know check in on stuff have more meetings and whatever else but actually i've built the life that i didn't even think was possible not in my wildest dreams and now it's my responsibility to help other people do the same thing. You know, where I'm from, you don't do this. This is not this is not a real life. And so I just want to make sure that everyone possible that wants to change their life has someone that can help them do it. Yeah. And just know that it's possible to change your life this way. You know, you hear people all the time saying, oh, I wish I didn't have to go into this nine to five or I wish I could pick up and move to this new city. But they're they're too scared because they have so much uncertainty about how they'll make their living. Well, the entrepreneurial process is a great thing to explore for this, these types of people. Like you said, you're in Portugal right now. I bounce all around the Americas. Um, I'm headed to Asia at the end of this year. And you know the business that I've built and the way that I've structured it allows myself, like you, to have this lifestyle, freedom, and flexibility. That's in our tagline. You know, We're here to help you get into the mindset of how to build your lifestyle of freedom and flexibility. And that's exactly what you're doing. Kimmy, what trend are you currently seeing in the, the housing market or just real estate in general that's really exciting you? Yeah, I mean, we touched on it a little bit before, but for me, the trend is, is about sharers and it's about, well, we've got a sharing collaboration type movement now, haven't we? You know, we've got yeah, we do. Uber, Uber we've and... got, yeah, Uber, Airbnb, all of these models, car share services, but people are actually saying, you know what, I don't need the asset or actually I don't want to pay for it all the time. So let's share share it around. And when I talked to you a few minutes ago about the strategy of renting something and then putting in sharers, the other way you can do that or the strategy often combine it with is Airbnb. So we'll have maybe two full-time sharers in a property and then we might have two from Airbnb on, which all means right. that instead of making $550 a month from that room, you can put someone in that's traveling and make $70 a night. Right. And exactly. that's a really great, um, it's a, another great way as an entrepreneur, we're talking about to sweat the assets some more, but it's another great trend we're seeing. And it doesn't matter if you're living somewhere at the moment, you could Airbnb your room. If you're, you know, your mate has got a house that's sitting empty, you can Airbnb that. And I think the really exciting thing about using sharers as a, as a model is that it doesn't really matter what happens to house prices. So when house prices are high, rent goes up because less people can afford to buy. So house prices are really high, rent is also really high. When house prices drop, rent also stays high or it goes higher because suddenly you've got a lot of competition market, buy to let and people that are investing will buy and try and rent it out. So you've suddenly got a lot more competition in the market. So this is such a powerful trend and um, putting sharers in and using the asset like this because it will ride out any market. Right. And real estate is typically a very good inflation hedge as well. I mean, as we know, governments around the world are printing money at unprecedented rates and 
forcing interest rates lower than than what they would be if the market was in charge of setting interest rates. So not only are you being incentivized by the government through low interest rates to get into real estate, but you're also being incentivized through inflation. Because if you had, let's say, fifty thousand dollars or fifty thousand pounds in cash just sitting there well that money is actually getting less and less valuable as it sits in your bank account but if you have it in in real estate it's historically been a really good hedge for inflation yeah absolutely and you know the the stat that's thrown around is that every 10 years regardless of recessions or depressions house prices double every 10 years and Actually, it's pretty much true. You can take a 10 year split from most of you know the past history and, and you'll see that happen. There have been, of course, times when it's been stagnant. So we saw 08 to 13, 12, 13, not a lot happened in the market. And then mm-hmm. the last year, it's all gone a bit crazy. So I think it's something that you have to be cautious about wanting to make short term profit in if you're buying the wrong part of the cycle. But yeah, it's a long term place to have your wealth. I mean, it's I, I don't think there's anything better. Let's wrap up here a bit. What advice would you have for people that are just getting started in real estate and wanting to create the type of cash flow required to create their lifestyle, freedom and flexibility like you've built for yourself? Yeah, so I would say start with the end in mind. And something about real estate, and I think it's because it's one of the oldest businesses there's ever been, is that it's still quite an old school business in a lot of ways, which means that you'll hear about investors that have been investing 20 years they might even be fairly wealthy, but they're still driving around in some battered old car because they're lugging paint and tiles and running around to do this viewing because they think it saves them money. Right. And it absolutely doesn't. So one of the first things I'll say to people is figure out how many hours per week you work and then figure out how much you earn. You need to divide the hours that you the, the amount you earn by the hours you work. And that's going to give you a figure. That's your hourly rate. So anything you can outsource that's lower than your hourly rate, you should be. Because it costs you more to do it than it does to get someone else to do it. Kimmy, I absolutely love that. Figure out your hourly rate. And if it's below, then delegate it out. Exactly. And it only has to start with, you know, odd jobs and and, uh, maybe a a phone answering service or an assistant in the Philippines that you pay a few dollars an hour to. But just start to free up your time because you, no one can earn more money in your business than you can. No one can sell you to investors as well as you can. No one can speak to in the early days, homeowners as well as you can. So you want to be doing the high value tasks and letting everyone else do the low ones. Right. I think the saying is the entrepreneur needs to work on the business rather than in the business. Exactly. And it's not easy because everyone around you is like, oh, you know, it'll only take you an hour to do it yourself or just do this. You're lazy. But it isn't. It's smart. And if I had done that i mean fortunately i'm hopeless at anything practical so it just wasn't an option for me but if i had done that i would still be doing it i'd still be trudging around trying to put up wardrobes because it's such a difficult cycle to get yourself out of once you're in it so start as you mean to go on yeah it's easy to think i can do this right i know how to do this if you want it done right do it yourself but a real entrepreneur is going to sit down figure out exactly how to do it right write it down I'm currently in the process of writing out all of my workflows for the podcast, recording videos for uh, you know a virtual assistant because I need to work on my business and I'm still working too much in my business, Kimmy. So I think that's some really great and powerful advice there. Uh, Kimmy, can you tell us the name of your book again, where we can get it, what your website is, what you offer on the website and how people can get in touch with you? Yeah, for sure. So the name of the book is The Power of Real Estate Investing, Seven Steps to Make Money and Create a Lifetime of Wealth. It is on Amazon and in all the usual places. If you go to kemi.gift, kemi.gift, um, you can grab a free copy. If you just pay for the shipping, I pay for the, the print version. And it will be on its way to you. And you also get free access to our membership site, which is Freedom Property Academy, with a load of videos and trainings on the stuff I spoke to today. But our home site is freedomacademies.com. And like you said, we've got the podcast on there, the blogs, the videos. There's a whole load of free information Uh, um, there's also a few programs so if you're looking to raise finance you can grab our our audio program cash on demand which is how i raised millions of dollars and you can get access to our free training which is how we sweat the assets and talking more about the things we mentioned today kimmy this sounds great and that was kimmy.gift g-i-f-t as in like a present yeah 
Awesome. That's great, Kimmy. Well, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, if people want to reach you, I'll have I'll direct them to your website, freedomacademies.com. I'll put all the links to your book and your website in the show notes down below um, when we post. And yeah, Kimmy, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on the show today. Oh, it's been my pleasure. I've really enjoyed our chat. Thank you for having me. Thanks again for listening to episode 39, From Homeless to Owning $1 Million Homes. Stay tuned for a very special episode with the one and only Jeffrey Tucker, which will be released very soon. If you don't know who Jeffrey Tucker is, head on over to our Facebook or Twitter feeds and click on the interview that he previously did with Stefan Molyneux. It's going to be a really exciting interview, and again, it should be coming out in just a few weeks. Until then, keep building freedom. <laughs>